Refugees, a poem by Brian Bilston. They have no need of our help, so do not tell me these haggard faces could, could belong to you or me should life have dealt a different hand. We need to see them for who they really are, chancers and scroungers, layabouts and loungers, with bones up their sleeves, cutthroats and feeds. They are not welcome here. We should make them go back to where they came from. They cannot share our food, share our homes, share our countries. Instead, let us build a wall to keep them out. It is not okay to say these are people just like us. A place should only belong to those who are born there. Do not be so stupid to think that the world can be looked at another way. Recently, I was sat on the train to work and there was a group of people around me chatting. One of them was American. At one point, they, the American passed their passport over to a British member of the group and the British person had a look at their visa and said, why is it stamped? No recourse to public funds. What does that mean? And I <clears throat> took my headphones off and interjected into the conversation and explained that it meant that this person, this US citizen, could get basically nothing off the British state. All they'd get was the most urgent emergency treatment off the NHS. Any other tr treatment they had, they would have to pay for themselves. And if they found themselves out of work or destitute, then they'd get only the most basic help that remains under the vestiges of the Elizabethan poor law. And it basically means that they don't starve to death before they're deported from the country. Now, the reality of the asylum and immigration system is wildly more complex than this, but this, that's the essential basics of it. That's what this statement in that visa meant. Why am I talking about this American on my train? Well, in September 2015, the photo of the body of the drowned Syrian boy Alian Kurdi washed up on a beach in Turkey shocked the world. And images like this continue to shock us all. In response to that photo, world leaders, particularly in Europe, were embarrassed into action. German Chancellor Angela Merkel opened up her country to refugees. Our own Prime Minister at the time, David Cameron, announced an enhanced scheme to move the most vulnerable Syrian refugees from camps in Lebanon and Jordan. And in Lebanon, over one million Syrians now live in a country of the population of one and a half million. Move these families to the UK. Now, barely a year after this photo of this poor dead boy in the arms of a police officer shocked the world, we're now into a world where the Daily Mail is poking its long lens cameras through the bushes of a children's home in Devon to take photos of children who have been settled in the UK from the camp in Calais known as the jungle. Now these are not children like Alien or the children in the previous slide. They're not cute and young. They're teenagers who have travelled thousands of miles across Europe. Often they've been trafficked by human traffickers who exploit their vulnerability. They've been through absolute unimaginable hell. If someone took photos of young people with a long lens camera who were under 18 in any other circumstances, the chances are the, that photographer would be vilified by newspapers like the Daily Mail for offences against children. But in post-Brexit Britain, this is a situation we find ourselves in and this seems normal. Now what relevance does this have for social policy? Why does my American with no recourse to public funds matter here? Because it goes to the heart of what social policy is about. Who gets what and why? It's also an immediate challenge that's literally on our doorsteps. For the EU, the European Union, the movement of dis displaced people into the single market and the Schengen travel area is one of the greatest existential threats to the Union has ever faced. 
The European Research Council, who fund research in universities, are focusing on this area as a key area for investment in future academic research by universities. This vast movement of people, more Syrians now live outside of Syria than live in the country itself. This vast movement of people puts strains on the resources of countries who have to pay to support these people, and countries have to decide who deserves this level of support. Now, as we have discussed as we've gone through this module, in various ways, the welfare state represents a social contract between citizens and the state and between citizens. For example, in the post-war period, people gave up their right to individually organise their own welfare through a mix of private and cooperative and voluntary provision and accepted being forced by the state to contribute to collective responsibility in return for the social protections this offered. As discussed in the blog post on Marshall, one way of understanding this is as social citizenship. Marshall's logic when he argues around social citizenship is sound, although one of the criticisms is that the argument is tainted with what historians would term is a Whiggish approach, that history and humanity is constantly improving, and that civilization has progressed through legal and political citizenship to end up with social, social citizenship. This is a very neat argument, but it's not necessarily plausible when we look at the details of it. Those of you who did essay question one will have been uncovering the fact that this, the expansiveness of Marshall's concept of social citizenship is curtailed by who we define as a citizen. Most obviously in the post-war welfare state, women and children were only really citizens as the wives and children of working men. The breadwinner man in the family was the citizen of social citizenship. So we have this model of social citizenship. But does this extend to all six billion plus humans on the planet? Well, no, of course not. As I discussed earlier in the semester, the easiest way to curtail the notion of citizenship is to put a border around an area and call everyone within it a citizen of that country. And now we get to the crux of why migration matters to social policy. Migrants, by their very definition, have not contributed directly through taxes or social insurance payments, or in kind through their contributions to wider society, to the social citizenship of the country they have arrived into. Yet the reason they desperately try and get to Europe on flimsy, overloaded boats across the Mediterranean Sea is because they see the opportunities that a healthy economy supporting a good welfare state would provide them. It provides a secure basis for them when they flee the horrors of war, violence and oppression. Yet we do not necessarily expend, extend support to these people. These people have no recourse to public funds. And if you think this is a particularly British issue, this description of Sweden by Dominic Hind in his 2016 book will be of interest. Quote, the snow is beginning to drift against the chain link fence that separates the railway line from the woods in the St Stockholm suburb of Fleming Flemingsburg, a new build satellite town, a short ride by commuter train from Stockholm Central Station. The, the thermometer is below zero. At the other end of the platform is a woman in a headscarf carrying a blue IKEA bag stuffed with cushions, heads off from the station's back entrance. Her destination is an abandoned bridge abutment stacked with caravans and wood shacks. This little parade of homes and house, uh, homes houses around 40 Roma migrants. Citizens mostly of Romania. They fit into neither the EU ideals of skilled mobile neighbor, labor, nor into the diverse group of political and economic migrants whom Sweden's generous asylum policies seek to aid. Those arriving in Sweden without financial means are forced onto unregulated black markets or compelled to live in temporary camps." End quote. 
The briefest of internet searches on the way Australia has treated asylum seekers in their camps on the Pacific Islands, such as Nauru, should also horrify you as to how a country can treat people it counts as outsiders. Of course, no, almost no country in the world is as, is, is as vindictive enough as to refuse help to all foreign nationals. Most countries abide by the United Nations Convention on the Status of Refugees and offer immediate help, support and asylum to people fleeing war, torture or other degrading and inhuman treatment. But even that process, though, leads to rationing of resources in some way, such as the utterly despicable way some asylum seekers in the UK have to prove to the authorities that they are gay. But let's take a step back here for a moment. For a moment. Are new migrants, in-migrants, that much of a burden on the countries they move into? The answer is pretty much a resounding no. As the very highly respected National Institute for Economic and Social Research demonstrated, the group that caused so much disgusting hate to be spouted during the EU, my, EU referendum, migrants from the new EU member states, otherwise known as A8 migrants, that joined the EU after 2008, have overall led to a substantial economic boost to the country's economy. Migrants generally tend to be younger than the average population they move into. And it costs a lot to move between countries, both in terms of your own resources and in terms of your own emotions and resilience. And it's a very disruptive process. If you have felt awkward on a two-week holiday in Benidorm when no one speaks English around you, you'll have a very, very, very slight inkling of what this feels like. If you're an international student at this university, you'll know even more of what this disruption feels like. Because of these issues, migrants tend to be reasonably well-educated and reasonably well-off. Further, when they arrive they, in the country they're moving to, they tend to do work that they are underqualified for and they do it very well until they are successfully integrated into the country. And when, then they might end up doing the work that they're actually qualified to do. A, a report by my colleagues comparing A8 migrants to migrants from the older EU member states who live in Scotland showed this. There are loads of other benefits to bringing migrants to a country. And if you want to know more about this and you're doing sociology, social policy and criminology, I'd recommend you do Marina Shapiro's module on race and immigration in your third or fourth year. Further, in the UK, with a population of nearly 70 million, the flows of migration we experience are relatively small. So in sum, we're not talking about a big group of people. They largely produce benefits for the country they, uh, they end up settling in. And they definitely do not represent a massive burden on the welfare state or other social benefits of social citizenship, such as education and healthcare. Why then, we should ask, are these groups, why are migrants so vilified in our political discourse in this country, in our political discourse, particularly how it relates to social policy? In her book, Revolting Subjects, Tyler counts refugees and immigrants as one of the major groups in Britain, British society, that are now made abject. Now we can think of abjection as a social emotion. Disgust is what one individual feels in response to something or someone we are repulsed by. Abjection is this on a social level, where social discourses, particularly in the media, make a group the subject of disgust. Other groups subject to, dis to abjection would be gypsies and travellers, or lone parents. And these are also covered by Tyler in her book. This abjection drives an irrational hatred of the group being made abject. And, if, and in, in turn, a feeling of alienation and, and exclusion on their part as a result of being subject to this abjection. And this abjection then leads to an overreaction to the issue of benefits for in-migrants and asylum seekers. Well, if we go back though to the second lecture of semester, I showed you all my tax statement.
On this, I highlighted the very large sector of expenditure that is given over to pensions, and specifically the state pension in the UK. Indeed, the state pension is subject to what we refer to as the triple lock, which means every year the state pension will rise by average wa wages, infl prices, inflation, or by 2.5%, whichever of those is the highest measure in that year. This means that the UK state pension will always rise every year, year on year. And this is in a context where other benefits to working age recipients have been frozen, their eligibility criteria reduced, and their conditions made particularly strict and arbitrary. Record numbers of people use food banks because they have no other choice. When we consider that giant chunk of UK government expenditure that goes on the state pension, and that due to the triple lock, it will always grow exponentially as part of a shrinking or static total government managed expenditure. We might suppose that older people are almost anti-abject. This benefit to older people seemingly cannot be questioned. They have earned it through their working lives. Whereas the families who struggle to get sustained employment in, a, in an economy dominated by low-paid, low-skilled, insecure employment are vilified as being lazy. A good example of this deservingness of older people is the Women Against the State Pension Inequality Campaign, otherwise known as WASPI. Now, this campaign had been very successful making one particular very small policy decision seem very, very unfair. Now, for over a decade, the UK government has been increasing the retirement age of women to be in line with that of men. In 1945, the retirement age for women was set at 60, and it was set at men for 65. And they've been trying to close that gap so women and men retire at the same age. This is because women are now living longer than men, women are now working in far greater numbers than men, and also to provide gender equality. Now, one particular cohort of women, those born after April 1951 and in the 1950s, have been subject to a particularly large jump in their retirement age. Now, the WASPI campaign is fierce with the SNP MP Barry Black regularly speaking on behalf of the campaign in Westminster. Most people agree that the communication of the change of the retirement age to the women has been quite appalling. But what I want to focus on here is many of the arguments made by the campaign, and these, in, these increasingly focus on the fairness that women have paid into a national insurance fund. Therefore, they should get the benefits they were promised by Beveridge in 1945. Another argument they make is that while the retirement age is increasing, the process of equalising it means the increase for women is much greater than it is for men. Now these two arguments related to fairness are quite different from an argument that just suggests that the implementation and communication of that change in retirement age was quite poor with little communication to the women affected. And as those of you who did coursework essay 3 will have discovered, questions of fairness are incredibly complex and relative. What is fair to one person may be grossly unfair to another. We end up having to rely on solely on moral imperatives that are inherently subjective. Now I could go off on a tangent here to discuss one of my favourite topics, Harb Marcy's theory of communicative action, but I shall save you that. Suffice to say, though, that more normative arguments are easy to make, but much trickier to defend. However, in this case, in the case of the WASPI campaign, they seem to be very persuasive. And many people support this campaign and this emotive message of unfairness towards these women that the campaign communicates. But the wide benefits that older people enjoy are increasingly being questioned. Comment pieces that pitch the baby boomers against the millennials regularly pop up, the latest incarnation being to blame the ele election of the fascist Donald Trump on the baby boomer generation. 
This generation, like my mum, who many of you would have listened to my interview with, who are now retired, could take advantage of the high post-war economic growth, low socio-economic inequality, high returns to labour from production in the form of high and increasing wages in return for productivity increases, a house building boom followed by a sustained period of low house building, inflating high house prices, free health care and free education. The millennials, us, are inheriting a world with disgusting right-wing politics, a completely fucked up environment, a limping global economy, and have to pay for the benefits of the previous generation through their meagre earnings in the gig economy. As the recent tri industrial tribunal against the taxi firm Uber highlighted. This has led to a concern with what we term intergenerational equity. That the older generation are gaining disproportionate, unfair benefits. The triple lock on pensions is being questioned now, even by a House of Commons select committee. But thinking back to our asylum seekers, do we need to make ba the baby boomer abject to question their benefits and redistribute resources more fairly? In chapters six and seven of Good Times, Bad Times, Hills provides a resounding no in answer to this question. As he highlights using data from the Wealth and Assets Survey, the inequalities within generations are far greater than the inequalities between generations. And it should be fairly obvious that wealth is something that you accumulate over time. I save regularly, therefore I am wealthier each month. This is not necessarily grossly unfair on somebody who's 10 years younger than me. It might be unfair on people the same age as me who can't save the same, but somebody who's 10, 10 years younger than me has an extra 10 years to save as much as I've managed to save. But what we do see, and is more problematic, is that successive generations are saving less at any given age. But the longest wave of equality is how this intragenerational inequality is transmitted through inheritance, the bank of mum and dad, the focus of chapter seven in Hill's book. This means that many people transmit their wealth through their family, using their wealth to help their children get up the property ladder, for example, further exacerbating existing inequalities. And as Hills points out, one of the few things that mitigates against this, particularly in England, is the means test for social care in later life. This takes into account the, the amount of assets people hold. So basically people have to sell their homes and use their savings to pay for their care in older life. This is inadvertently progressive. Poor people get their care free or at very low cost because of it. And yet, as a policy measure, it causes absolute uproar. Why should I have to sell my house? I've worked hard for years to pay for my care and my house. Now, I find this uproar really, really odd. And we can use the experience of council housing to critically question this. Back in 1980, over half of households in Scotland rented their home from their local council, as Taylor Swift told you. Yet 30 years later, we talk about home ownership in the UK being naturally what people aspire to. Well, similarly, inheriting substantial sums for, from parents was much less common. The notion that one should pay a substantial inheritance tax upon death had support across the political spectrum. Those on the right and left could both see it was vastly unfair for people to have a gross advantage because of their parents' wealth. Yet now we're in a situation where you can win elections on the base of not taxing the wealth people have worked so hard to collect and want to pass on to their children, presumably so their children don't have to work so hard. 
So things have been different in the past. They can be different again. Further, in the UK, we don't really tax wealth. In particular, we don't have an efficient property or wealth tax. Therefore, if someone invests their income in housing or other property and just does nothing, it is extremely likely to increase in value without them even using it and at no particular cost to the owner of that property. All of this adds up to a country with growing polarisation. A minority of people with skills, secure jobs earn enough to accumulate relatively vast amounts of wealth that is then transmitted and amplified down the generations as their children do better in education, get better jobs and use their inherited wealth to increase their own wealth. Meanwhile, the majority of people have seen their earnings stagnate. With growing poorly paid self-employment self and the proliferation of zero hours contracts and low skilled shift work. These people simply do not have the income to start accumulating any wealth. And yet to return to the start of this lecture, we focus on migrants stealing our resources in our political rage. So the here and now in social policy is a pretty grim situation. With policies like the benefits cap and the slow rollout of universal credit, it does not look like things are going to get better any time soon. The political discourse around social policy has made all recipients of benefits, except for the state pension, abject. We must get the benefits bill down. So the politicians tell us on all sides that any changes that are made are very, very marginal. Work capability assessments of employment and support allowance are getting very slightly less horrific. So there's fewer headlines around people dying after they've been found fit for work. The Scottish Government is changing universal credit payments to fortnightly instead of monthly. But what, so this is the here and now, what might the future look like? <clears throat> the current Channel 4 drama, Humans, actually gives what many people think is a likely portrayal of what is likely to happen. Since the 1960s, minority world or industrialised countries have seen the number of people employed in manufacturing industry collapse as machines replace labour. One skilled worker could control an entire assembly line. And this saw shifts of work to the service industries and jobs where the skills that humans seem to innately have are needed. We are now on the cusp of a world where artificial intelligence and much more banal technology will take another swathe of these level jobs out of our economy. At the most basic level, a bank of self-service checkouts in a supermarket can process 20 customers with, the number of, with two members of staff rather than just one customer at a time. In systems like railways, Humans are now the weakest link in safety. If they were automated, they would run perfectly safely until something went, it went only slightly wrong, and then the system would shut down and it would come to a halt with everyone safe. <clears throat> the motor industry is investing heavily in self-driving vehicles. And while the attention might be on things like Tesla and the Google car, Actually, a lot of the investment is going to heavy goods vehicles that will travel in convoys without drivers, revolutionising the transport of goods. On my phone, Google now automatically populates my calendar with train and flight details from the booking emails that are sent to my inbox. It listens in the background. And when, after I've been chatting about something, it will automatically fill in the search bar on that subject when I click on search. My phone is my personal assistant. 
Now, you might think this future of artificial intelligence might be as fanciful as that opening clip of 2001 A Space Odyssey, that the unique skills that humans have could never be replaced in the service sector. But if you think about a lot of the jobs, a lot of these base level jobs in shops and restaurants and even in places like universities, they're actually about carrying out very basic processes with very limited discretion. And they would be very, very easy to automate. Last year, a report by researchers at the University of Oxford and the consultants Deloitte caused quite a stir by highlight highlighting just how many jobs might go from our economy in the next 20 years. Well, what does this automation mean for social policy? Well, first of all, it means, very practically, that the delivery of policy will be very different. One of the challenges with the implementation of universal credit by the UK government has been the idea that the Department for Work and Pensions would collect live income information on claimants and adjust their monthly universal credit payments based on this. <clears throat> this is almost impossible at the moment. We just don't have the IT capabilities to do this, to link up employers' computers with the computers at the um, Department for Work and Pensions. <clears throat> but it probably won't be impossible far sooner than you think. And it's not inconceivable as well, when we think back to Jane Robertson's lecture, that in a decade, electronic monitoring in someone's home and the health data collected from their mobile devices can be combined with an artificial intelligence asking questions to develop a care plan, monitor it on an ongoing basis, and alter the care plan when change is needed. This future might seem inconceivable now and almost unethical, but it is being worked on now and will become our reality in the future. It has to become our reality because we can't afford to deliver a care otherwise. Also concerning for social policy is the predictions of the millions of people who will lose their jobs. Will we see the division between those with high skills that can't be automated, people like me, and including those who actually build the artificial intelligence, and others who are left unemployable. One response to this, which I discussed in the podcast with Professor Kirsty Rummery, is the idea of a basic income or a citizen's income. The idea is that this base level of income would stop people from literally dying, it would provide that safety net, but also go a bit further than that and allow them to explore creative opportunities that the new economy might offer. Now, there is growing support for the basic income, and, exper and experiments in it keep proliferating, the latest being in the Canadian province of Ontario. Most of the pros and cons of these I discussed with Kirstein in our podcast, but the trouble is it hasn't been done yet, so we don't have evidence about what might happen or what the impact of a basic income might be. All I can do is philosophise about it and theorise on what the impacts of giving people a basic income might be. Now to wrap up this lecture and try and make some sense of the journey we've come on, I'm going to try and conclude. Changes in our world and our global context are putting pressures on our social policy policies and frameworks. I use the examples of the wars across the world causing people to flee. But in future, this is just as likely to believe to be sea level rises caused by global warming. And our po policy discourses focus on this, focus on these people fleeing. And policy is made on the basis of a very small number of people making a very small impact on an overall budget of many billions of pounds. Is this what should, we should be debating when we consider social policy? No. There are bigger challenges we face right now in terms of our socioeconomic inequalities and how resources are distributed in our society that we need to have a debate about. The question might be, in our current post-truth world, can we have such a discussion and debate 
without resorting to the discourses of hatred and objection. If millions of working people are thrown out of work by automation, who are they going to blame if we use a discourse of abjection? To end, the world can be looked at another way. Do not be so stupid to think that a place should only belong to those who are born there. These are people just like us. It is not okay to say, build a wall to keep them out. Instead, let us share our countries, share our homes, share our food. They cannot go back to where they came from. We should make them welcome here. They are not cutthroats and thieves with bombs up their sleeves, layabouts and loungers, chances and scroungers. We need to see them for who they really are, should life have dealt a different hand. These haggard faces could belong to you or me. So do not tell me they have no need of our help.